Lift up our hearts, lift up our praises, lift up our needs, lift up our love to you. And you are always there. 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Always ready and willing to hear our praises, hear our cries. And for this we give thanks. Even those that couldn't be with us today because they're traveling or away or are ill and just put your arms around them, Lord. Right this very moment, let them feel a burst of love, knowing that they are missed and they are loved. Until they get back together with us. Be with the pastor as he delivers your spoken word. And be with us as we lift our hearts and praise to you. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for everything that you do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. We're going to start off with a beautiful word. Glory. Glory to his name. What a perfect sign. Hymn number two. Right in front of you, hymn number two. Glory to his name.
short business meeting after our uh, preaching service here today, and it has to do with Chris Tigner and our missionary Nelson Di Carbello. Uh, our Constitution and bylaws states if we uh, exchange anything or give out anything more than a thousand dollars that's not previously budget, budgeted and earmarked, it has to go before the congregation. And that's the case with Chris Singer. So you will hear the details on that uh, in that meeting. And Nelza, uh, Pastor announced last week that Ariel Di Carvello, uh, our missionary to the Cape Verde Islands, passed away. But his wife plans to stay on the field. And the missionary clearinghouse, <coughs> it's going to cut everything off April the 1st. We've already sent everything for March. But they're sending church. Up in Alexandria, I believe. The sending church is going to continue. If anybody that wants to support Nelsa, because she plans, she says her family now is on the field. And she plans to stay there. And I didn't know until we got the details uh, that, that they actually have five children. She's going to stay there with her people and uh, stay there in the island. So her sending church is going to take care of. Uh, Giving money to her after the uh, missionary uh, clearinghouse finishes up. So that's going to be the other thing within our uh, meeting today. Uh, John Sharp, you can see in there John Sharp Celebration of Life. He passed away on January the 7th, and there'll be a Catholic Speedway at 11067 Johnson Road, Ashland, Virginia. So if you uh, plan to attend that, that's the details on that as well. Um, there's a whole lot of information here on the Chris Tigner, but it's the same that was in the bulletin for last week. I will tell you this, that I talked to a really good friend of mine from Landmark this past week, and their pastor, there is no new information. We don't have any update on how Mrs. Tigner is doing, and we still don't have a date on Chris and Lois as a family plan to come home. So, uh, as we know that, we will certainly uh, give you an update on that as well. Well, the next thing is we'll be having Jim White as our guest speaker, representing the Gideons International on Sunday, March the 27th, next week. Uh, during our morning uh, worship service, we'll also be taking up a love offering for the Gideons on that day. The Gideons do a fantastic job in getting God's Word into the hands of uh, hearts of millions of people each year. And this is just a small way that we can, can celebrate and give back uh, to the Gideons. Uh, and the last thing, uh, we are having our fellowship meal uh, next week. And I know here's something that we want to, to clarify. There has been a sign-up sheet for, you want to bring this, bring potatoes out, or whatever it is you want to bring. But we normally have just a sign-up list to get a number. And there are several things that we are preparing for. How much chicken, the drinks, uh, lemons, hot rolls, whatever the case might be. Um, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always take two anyhow. Okay, but anyway, uh, we, we're doing well on the sign up sheet for the food, but I would like to ask if you're planning to be here next week, would you raise your hand, please, and let Al in the back is going to get a count so that we can have an idea of how many rolls are in the food. <laughs>
was a fully clothed, and he was sitting on the end of the ramp. And he said, you know, I think I can walk up that ramp. I said, well, walk up the ramp. And he got up out of the wheelchair and walked up the ramp. And he said, I really got the wheelchair in case you leave. <laughs>
This is the theme for our church this year. The Philippines is slowly but surely continuing to relax their restrictions of the pandemic. We are finally able, after almost two years, to have a normal Thursday night visitation and a monthly family visitation. We've been visiting and holding Bible studies uh, for the last couple of years, and he says even in doing that, as they hold it that in their Bible studies, even though they couldn't go door to door with large groups, uh, that they were having people saved, and not only are people being saved, but they're also uh, getting ready for baptism. And he said one of the great things about it, now that the restrictions have left, they had 94 people in attendance to blitz a neighborhood to go out and, and give out tracts and for visitation. And he said that not only are they just handing out the tracts, they're trying to, to get to know the people and set up Bible studies and get them, uh, get that information in their hand and get them to come to the church. And he says, everything is just getting better day by day and week by week. And he says, our work in July is, is continuing to grow. And we had to build a second kiosk for our children's class. They grew this small room in the church building and they have 30 to 40 kids just in this one age group uh, every Sunday, and that's why they had to expand. Our young people are filling up their kiosk each Sunday, and there are more than 20 people in the younger class as well. Several of these people have made professions of the faith and now being discipled, and he wants you to pray about this. He says, some of the parents of the unsaved children are trying to keep them from, from coming Pray that we would be able to see many of them attend the camp this year. Now, they have Camp Victory, and they're praying that uh, nothing will change. Right now, they're okay, and they're planning to have, and even having some activities at Camp Victory, uh, but pray that there won't be any issues uh, when they have their larger groups throughout the summer. As of right now, we're holding an annual camp and Youth Victory. We're excited. Uh, they also built, they had money that came in, they had a drive to build bunk beds. They have built bunk beds for most of the cabins, but they say, he said, that they still need an additional $4,000 to build the rest of the beds to completely furnish everything they need in the camp. Uh, then he talks about his mom for a minute. He says, thanks for all years of praying for my mom, Virginia Wynn, to be able to come back home, uh, and this is after her, his dad died, and they brought him back to the States uh, for burial. So this was a lot had happened to her, and Josh were trying to get back. Now listen to this. But after 18 days in a hotel room in, in uh, Manila, they were quarantined for that period of time before they could even get back into the country. She said she finally made it home, and she is so happy to be back. Please pray that, uh, that they're now trying to, through his mom, John's mom to start a widow's program, and they have uh, 13 ladies ranging from the age of 30 to 80 that they want to try to get this widow for program started. And he says, our Soldiers on the Cross Club is, is up and running, and we're so excited for the homemade. They made all of their own material uh, for this program. Now, homemade curriculum for our people to see all the efforts and taking place in the book that we use uh, the church of the spread the gospel. And pray for a missionary. They've got a missionary program. Now missionaries have missionary programs as well. And they said, so we want the Lord to use uh, these folks. And pray for two <coughs> men that have been sent out on deputation. Gerald and Nalja Diaz to Taiwan. John Kim Warren, uh, Ro Warren Rose to Tanzania. And Jazeel and Raina to Indonesia. So folks, as you can see, this is a wonderful update. Some of our patients have been wounded by shrapnel and gunfires and other like this. 
this woman who was seven months pregnant uh, fled from eastern Ukraine. She was experiencing some com complications due to the stress and the chaos of evacuation. Her baby became unusually still, and she came to her clinic very worried. When she was uh, able to hear his heartbeat through the ultrasound performed by our team, she cried with relief, knowing her baby was still healthy and growing. We are so thankful that she was able to receive this reassurance and comfort that is needed in the midst of such pain and suffering. Would you continue to join me in praying for the people of Ukraine? Their lives have been torn apart by the conflict, and we were grateful for your prayers uh, for the safety of our staff as we are serving the broken and the hurting in the name of Jesus. So this is from Franklin Graham and Samaritan's Purse. So folks, that's a lot, but we have a lot to pray about, and we have a great God that can answer and meet each one of these needs.
a body racked with pain, who's in the final fleeting seconds summon her last ounce of ebbing strength to whisper Earth's sweetest name, Jesus, Jesus. Emperors have tried to destroy it. Philosophies have tried to stamp it out. Tyrants have tried to wash it in the face of this earth with the very blood of those who claim it. Yet still it stands. And there shall be that final day of every voice that has ever uttered a sound, every voice of Adam's race shall raise in one mighty chorus to proclaim the name of Jesus. For in that day, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is our Lord. Ah, uh, so you see, it is not the mere chance that caused the angel one night long ago to say to the virgin named him, his name shall be called Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Could you please say it with me? Jesus. 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 You know, there's something happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Blessing that is. 
I mean, think about it. He sent his son to die for us on the cross. He sent the gospel message to us. There was somebody that presented the gospel and thanked the Lord for that. It goes to show you it's, it's the Lord's work in our hearts and lives that can bring us conviction. But also it's because of these, the Bible talks about the foolishness of preaching that and, and the sharing of that gospel that people are saved. Also, he saved us not only they convicted our hearts of our sin, but also the Holy Spirit um, did the work, and his grace continues to sustain us day by day. Let's look for just a moment over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would. 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 12. Here, beginning in verse 7. Here, this portion is still kind of, it's still unknown as to, uh, it's talking about, Paul's talking here about the thorn in the flesh. It's uh, unknown what that genuinely was. It's never really put out there. Um, but notice what it says in verse 7 and down through verse 10. It says, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Uh, it, 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 let's pause there. Isn't that an amazing way of looking at that? You know, uh, we wonder why sometimes the Lord puts things in our path and allows to be in our path. And, and sometimes we don't look at it this way, do we? We always look at it like as, a, as an annoyance, as something that we've got to endure. But notice how Paul puts it. He, he looks at it, he says, a messenger, verse 7, of Satan above me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Basically what he's saying is this is keeping me from being prideful in myself. And he goes on and he says in verse 8, concerning this thing, I pled with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And notice verse 9, and he said, and this is what we're talking about, how that he sustains us in his grace. Verse 9 says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, this is what Paul says concerning what the Lord has told him. He says, therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, notice, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And notice, he understands the reality that it's Christ that gives him that strength to be able to persevere. It's not found in himself. And so what a blessing that is. And again, as we're talking about God's grace, uh, God gives us the grace that we need each day, day by day, moment by moment. What a blessing uh, it is to be able to not only understand it that, but to experience it as his child. Mm -hmm. Paul experienced it, and we can experience, it, experience that as well. God wants us to, as his children, to experience his grace. The grace of God also works in our lives to help us accomplish His will in the world. Paul gives us some insight in the ways uh, that the grace of God works in our life. Number one, we say His grace empowers us. Paul tells us that, uh, that the Lord is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Notice, it's not just in ourselves. We would probably have given up on the Lord a long time ago if it was just in our own strength. Right. We would have given up living for him a long time ago if that was just in our own strength. But he gives us the strength. That's the blessing of per persevering on. Also, before the day of Pentecost, the Lord made this promise to his disciples. But ye shall, in from Acts 1.8, he says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses of me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. But how did all that come about? 
Notice he says there again in Acts 1 8, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So it's the Holy Spirit that works in us. And again, I made that comment plenty of times. I don't believe that we talk about the Holy Spirit enough um, in, our, in, our, in our churches. For whatever reason, a lot of Baptist churches have really shied away from talking about it. Um, and, and if it's the Holy Spirit that brings conviction, it's the Holy Spirit that's our comforter, our constant uh, comforter throughout this whole life. I believe he also brings along conviction in our hearts and lives as we read the Word of God. So if, if there's anything we need to be talking about more, it's the Holy Spirit yeah. and his work in our hearts and in our lives and what he continues to do. Um, also the word power here. In, uh, in verse in Ephesians three twenty is the same. It refers to inherent power of the power that resides in a thing because of its nature. And you think about that in, in our own lives, our nature as true believers, if you've been genuinely converted to Christ, you're genuinely His child. We have a new nature. And what is that nature? It's no longer following after this world. It's no longer following after my desires and my wishes. But it's saying, hey, I'm putting those things to death. And Christ, what is your will for my life? We have a new nature. It is no longer to follow after Satan, his will, and his purposes. But it's to follow after Christ. And if, and if that's not, by the way, if that's not present, there's a problem. If we name the name of Christ, we say that we're Christ, Christians, Christ-like ones, and we have no desire to follow after him, there's a severe problem. And it's not on the side of God. It's, it's with us. Right. Also, the Lord enabled Paul to preach for his glory. Notice, if you would, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if you would, for a moment. And then we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 4 and 5. Here the Lord, we're talking about all that the Lord is enabling Paul to do. And by the way, we're reading about Paul, but he gives us the same power in our own lives to enable us to live for him and to glorify him as well. And here, uh, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 5. Four and five, the Lord here is enabling Paul to preach for his glory. It says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Notice what he's saying at the beginning. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words. He wasn't there to try to gain favor with man. What was it? To glorify God. Period. That's all. That was all that was really pressing upon Paul. And ultimately he died for it. He died for the cause of Christ. He died for being faithful to him. Also, if you would then look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to be reading a few verses here. Verses 3 through 10. Here, first of all, we saw the Lord enable Paul to preach for his glory. And again, we're talking about God's grace and empowers us. First, we saw there that the Lord empowered Paul to preach. Here, the Lord enabled Paul to live for the Lord. And we would say day by day, and he does the same for us. And here in 2 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 3, it says, Giving no offense, notice these things. And again, as we read these verses, let me pause here for a second. So many times we can start reading verses and we think, okay, this is Paul. Paul's talking about himself. Think, let's put ourselves into this equation. Because this is for us as well. And notice what it says. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Now, here's where some people may say, okay, well, I can zone out and take a nap here for the next few verses because I'm not a minister. Well, guess what? Each one of us are Christians. Each one of us are believers. There's things that he's going to say here that would actually hinder the cause of Christ in each one of our lives. And a lot of this still is embedded for each one of us. So it says that the ministry be not blamed. 
but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes or beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by love unfeigned, or basically a false love. Also by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. That's how he looks at his life. Think about those last few, I, I love that verses. 7 now, really down to verse 10, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness. This is exactly how Paul is able to live day by day. He goes on and he says, by honor and dishonor. These are the things that are working against him, but also what the Lord is working to accomplish. And he says, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true as unknown and yet well known as dying, and behold, we live. Such a paradox, isn't it? And he says, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Think about Paul. Where was he in most of his letters? He was in prison. And yet, through all of his letters, he's rejoicing with the churches he's talking to. What a blessing that is. Don't to realize that it didn't matter. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. It didn't matter to Paul where he was in his present condition. It was all about what his goal was and what was that, the magnification and the glorification of God and the furtherance of the saints. And that was his whole goal. And again, he's doing this, even through his writing here to the church of Corinth, and he ends up in verse 10 again, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making men rich. Paul here was poor, by the way. You're in jail. You're not doing well financially. And by the way, as he says at the end, and yet make and many and making many rich, and yet making many rich. It wasn't financial. It was spiritual. And this is what Paul was doing. He couldn't give these people money to further even the church if he wanted to. But how is he doing it? Through work for, through allowing Christ and through the Holy Spirit to continue to use him as a minister for them, uh, and what a blessing it is. So here, the Lord wants you to know that his grace is sufficient for you as well. He is able to empower you for service. He is able to empower you to live for him every day and spend that he gives us in this world, and his grace empowers us um, totally. And you think about that, you say, well, well I'm not a minister. You don't have to be a minister in order for the Lord to use you. Um, anything that we do for the cause of Christ. Um, we're going to read that verse just here in a moment. Um, but anyway, uh, we'll get to it in a minute. But you know, everything that we do, we do to the, to the glory of God. And, and that's really what it comes down to. Uh, secondly, so we not only see His grace empowers us, but His grace in enlivens us. Paul says, according to the power that works in us. The power to live for the Lord comes from Him. And it's not just us being a better you. It's not just us trying to, you know, um, drum ourselves up into better quote-unquote spirituality. It's Christ that empowers us to be able to do what we do for Him. And to be able to rely on Him. Um, it is possible only because he lives in us. When he saved us, the Spirit of God came into us uh, with power for God's glory. And that's what's amazing is that, so he not, what was the purpose of him saving us? Was to glorify him. 
You know, and, and again, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. He's, he's a very jealous God. He's a very selfish God. But that's okay. Why? Because he's God. He can be that. We can't. Why? Because we're the creation. And so that's in opposition to who he is. And so therefore, that's where uh, the problems begin. Just whenever we start to think that maybe he's doing us disservices. Sometimes we think that we know better than he does. And we become in direct opposition to God. Here also, Paul says it this way. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. What's he saying? He wasn't crucified physically. He was crucified spiritually. He was put to death. He understood what it meant. That whenever I come to know Jesus Christ, when Christ saved Paul, when Christ saved me, and when Christ saved you, we are to put our old man to death. True. Crucified. So I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Truly live. That's the ironic part, right? When you think about somebody being crucified, uh, not much life left there, right? But then when you think about what it meant, whenever Christ was crucified, what did it bring forth? Life. Whenever we are crucified in Christ, what does it bring forth? True life. Not just what this world brings. This is just nothing, right? And that's why they have to keep going back and going back to try to find more fulfillment. Why? Because it's unfulfilled. True. It's not life. It's actually spiritual death. But Christ is the one that gives us true life. And then he goes on, he says, In the life which I now live, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Not in Paul, not in Justin Vaughn, not in you, your name, you put your name in there, but it's through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for also in John uh, chapter 14, <clears throat> verses 12 through 14, Christ says it this way. Verily, verily, I say to you, he that believeth on me, the, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And you know, I thought about this as I was reading this text this week. Notice there in verse 12. Again, we're in John 14, verse 12. Notice what he says there again. Very, very, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And notice what he says right after this. And greater works than these shall he do. And you say, well, wait a minute. This is Christ talking. But notice what he goes on to say. Because I go into my Father. He was only here just for a short time. He was doing many, he was glorifying Christ, or glorifying the Father in his life while he was here. But he was only here for a just short few years. You think about our lives, that we have the opportunity, think about this, to glorify from the point that we became a believer to the time that we go home to be with him. How much more time that we have to be able to glorify God. And this is why he says here, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. He's going back home. But yet we have more opportunity. Why? Because we're still here. To do what? To glorify him. He's given us more opportunity. Every day that he gives to us is that more opportunity to glorify him. What a blessing that is. So here we, we, we finish this up. So there's a statement about God's greatness. Here we finish this point two up as far as talking about there's a statement about his grace. And then this last point here this morning is there's a statement about his glory. Going back to Ephesians 3, the last verse there, verse 21, says to him, talking about Christ, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Here, Paul ends his doxology by making a grand statement about the glory of God. And notice what he says about the glory of God. Number one, we would say the place of his glory. Notice he says to him, of, of, of 
Every, anything he could have said, he says, to him be glory in the church. Here the phrase reminds us that the church exists for the sole purpose of bringing glory to God. Period. That's why we're here. Um, we're not here to elevate ourselves. We're not here to even make ourselves feel good. That's not why we're here. Um, there was uh, there was a thing on Facebook. It was uh, they showed like the picture. They do these things where they show pictures from a movie and then put like little sayings that go along with it. And there was this guy and he had a little boy. The little boy was crying and he says, um, and basically, you know, Dad, I don't. Um, I don't like the songs that they play at church. And he said, and he put back that, or the dad, I'm sure this is the people in the um, But basically, the, the, the gist was is that the, the dad put back, he said, he said that basically the, the, the reason we go to church is basically not for what we like, it's to glorify God. Um, but the kids still cry. But, <laughs> but point being, and this is the fact that you know, it's not all about just what we want, what we like. I think that's very, that's a real danger, I would say, in a lot of churches today. But we need to be very, very careful. Um, and, and we'll probably get criticism for saying things like that. But here's the thing. Our whole motive of being here is to glorify God, which it should be. Now, I know that can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. But at the, at the end of the day, we have to understand if God was here, would he be glorified in what we're doing? Would he be glorified in what we're saying? Or is it more so making me feel good when we walk out the door? If the whole reason of us being here is just to elevate us to be able to get us to Wednesday or to get us to next Sunday, we failed. It's to glorify him. And the blessing of that, though, is, the triple down of that is, we will be blessed. And, and he will actually encourage our hearts in the giving of the glory to him. And that's the blessing. And then as we come as believers, to be able to come here corporately, to be able to worship him, to bring him the honor and glory that's due his name, we will in the end be blessed as well. So here is... As we look at the, this last verse in a little more detail, now we, and now as we live for him and honor his word, he receives glory from the church. As we love him and love one another, he is glorified. As we preach the gospel uh, and gather for worship, he's glorified. As we sing, pray, work, serve in the church, he's glorified. I don't care if we cut the grass, I don't care what we do around here. Whatever we're doing, if it's for the Lord, then we're glorifying Him. It does, it's not just the preacher up here preaching that glorifies the Lord. Sometimes it's even the encouragement that we can even bring to one another. Whenever someone comes here and maybe they're downtrodden, maybe they're discouraged, and we can encourage them in the Lord, that's glorifying Him. Everything that we do, everything that we say, should be to glorify him, and if it's done with the right proper motives, it will. Every person who serves here in any capacity should perform his or her job to the best of their ability. Why? For the glory of God alone. We must not work for the applause of men, but we must not um, we must not work to make a name for ourselves, but we must work for the glory of God. And then here's the verse I was looking for. First Corinthians 10 31, whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Notice what that verse says. It's in everything. Whenever you eat, glorify God. You know, whenever it, at, at home, you know, whenever we uh, pray over meals, it's not that we hope it tastes good. It's to actually glorify God, thanking Him for the meal that we have that He's provided. Uh, to eat, whether we drink, Everything that he's given, whether it's food, whether it's drink, to be able to thank him for that. Because it's ultimately from his hand. And then or whatsoever you do, whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter what it is, glorify God in it. Uh, I remember as a youth pastor, we would have kids come all the time and ask, you know, well, 
how do I know the will of God for me and for my life? Uh, you barely find out that for myself at moments. And you think about it, and, and uh, I would always say, I would always put it back to them this way, is I'd say, well, what, what is it that you like to do? What is the talent that you have? And they would basically tell me whatever that is. I said, well, who do you think gave you ultimately that talent? And it's the Lord. The Lord gives you that talent. I said, well, go and glorify God with it, whatever that might be. And I would always tell parents when they come, you know, what, what do you know, what, what should Johnny be doing for, you know, his life? And I would always tell them, you know, the Lord doesn't call us to glorify him, to please him, and come to him kicking and screaming. He wants us to be able to glorify him in the, in the talents and the abilities that he gives to us. And whatever that might be, it doesn't have to be preaching. It doesn't have to be missions. If you're a carpenter, if you're a nervous doctor, if you're oh, in business, whatever the case may be, is to glorify God with whatever he's given you the ability to do. And so here, this is exactly really the crux of what 1 Corinthians 10, 31 is all about. It's whatever we're doing, whether we're eating, drinking, whatever we're doing, ultimately please God and glorify Him in it. Then we see the person of His glory. Nowhere is God more glorified than in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus always has been and ever will be His beloved Son in whom He is well pleased. Since God is glorified in His Son, we should be in the business of making much of His Son, of Jesus Christ. We need to examine everything that we do, and even here, and even in our own worship. I put some things down, our music, our preaching, our service, our motives, and be sure that everything we're doing serves to magnify the Lord, period. John Piper, in one of his messages, made this statement. God is most glorified when I am most satisfied in Him. Think about that. God is most glorified when I am most satisfied in Him. And we'd ask the question, what is it that satisfies us in our life? What is it that brings us satisfaction in our life? For some, it may be a new car, maybe a new home, uh, just to have a happy family. Maybe a good job. Uh, not at odds with your neighbor, whatever the case may be. What is it that actually brings you satisfaction? Only when Christ is our sole satisfaction will he receive the just glory that he's truly due. So ultimately, we need to glorify him first and foremost. Why? As we understand the person of his glory, who Jesus Christ is. And then the last point is this, the permanence of his glory. This glory that God receives through the church and through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is not a fleeting glory, but Paul says it this way, throughout all ages, with world without end. Here, God will be receiving glory from his church because of his son when the end of time comes and eternity flows into eternity. Think about that. It, it, it's, it's very hard for us as, as humans to be able to really picture what heaven's going to be like. Mm -hmm. uh, we get glimpses of it. We get verses that talk about it. We have the revelation talks about the verses that talk about the beauty of it. But what that's going to be like, I mean, what our job titles will really be, um, we don't know. But I'm sure whatever it is, it's going to be glorifying God. Yeah. And so you say, well, so, so, what's, so what's the big deal about three sermons on glorifying God? Ultimately, it breaks it down to this point. Is that for us, each one of us as believers, we need to be glorifying Him in every aspect of our life over here. I know that sounds like sort of a, you know, well, that's a gimme. But maybe in our lives we're not truly doing that. Maybe in our lives there's areas where we, I think the danger for humans is that we compartmentalize what's important to us. And if we're not careful, even as believers, we'll do the same thing. 
will compartmentalize it. Well, this is for God, this is his slice of my life, and this is for me, and this is for my family, and et cetera, et cetera. And as that continues to grow, ultimately, God's portion of that pie grows smaller as we fill it in more. And what ends up happening? As a believer in God, that become, the glorification of him becomes smaller. And everything else in this life is then glorified more so than God. That's the danger. So through all of this that we've said, it really comes down to the point is that we need to examine our lives. We need to examine our hearts, whether we're truly glorifying him in every aspect of our life. Paul, that was something that, that, that was in constantly before him. He was, that was what motivated him, was the realization that my whole life is encapsulated around one thing, the glorification of God. That's what encouraged him and motivated him to write, to speak, to travel. Everything that he did was for the glorification of God and the furtherance of believers. And ultimately, what was the ultimate goal of even that aspect? For others to glorify him. That's what it really boiled down to. Really, in the end, we need to all grasp this reality. And then also hear the conclusion. I came across this example. I read this to Jennifer the other day. I thought this was very amazing. Talking about glorifying God in everything. Um, Johann Sebastian Bach. Most of us know that name. Um, all music uh, said this, all music should have no other end and aim than the glory of God and the soul's refreshment. Where there is, where this is not remembered, there is no real music, but only a devilish hubbub. <laughs> that was, that was Johann Sebastian Bach. And it goes on. Notice from there, at the top of every composition. Now, I came across this quote, and then, you know, you always got to fact check. You know, right? You don't get up here and, you know, it's not true. Because there's going to be people who will look this up, by the way. And, and this is true. So, here you go. Uh, at the top of every composition, he wrote the letters J.J. And those initials stood for Jesus Juva. In Latin, J.H. and the German composition equivalent, which means Jesus help me. Isn't that correct? Is that something? Jesus help me. Bach ended every composition, so that's how he began every composition. It's with J.J. Ultimately, Jesus help me. Then, in the end, he ended every composition with the letters S.D.G. Those letters stand for solia de gratia, which means to God alone the praise. Isn't that something? After every composition. And this is how, and you think about that. Here's Johann Sebastian Bach. And he even saw the need of glorifying God through what he was doing, through his music. That's how we began each, each composition. That's how we ended each composition, was glorifying God in what he was doing. And he was no Paul. <laughs> he wasn't getting across all these theological truths, but for what God had called him to do and given him the ability to do, he was glorifying God through that, for all the world to see. And that's exactly what he's called each one of us to do. And whatever we're doing, whatever the Lord has put our hands to do, not only to do with all of our might, but to bring him the glory. And so this moment in time is as good as any for the church to get busy about bringing him the glory that he is due. And that's what this whole series really has been about, is bringing him the glory. Um, and ultimately, we would say, it, and, and I'll tell you this, this is a, as, a, as a pastor, my fear in this is this. You spend time going through all of these Quotes, all of these verses, all of these thoughts, putting all this preparation together, and we do nothing with that. And I'm not just talking to you, I'm talking to me. So
So it's for us to be able to not only realize that what we've been talking about is true, but to apply it to our lives. That's what it comes down to. Is to glorify God in our lives and to realize that, hey, you know what? We're going to be doing it through all of eternity. You know, you might as well get used to it now. Right? <laughs> and, and it's not just get used to it because grudging, but it should be a joy, right? In everything we do to please our God. Why? You think about it, it's not just for everything he's done for us. He doesn't want us to please him out of a, out of a heart of indebtedness. He wants us to please him because we love him. Because he's given us the desire to glorify. What a blessing. Well, let's close our word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for what you've done, Father, in saving our souls. Every Father, if there's one here even this morning that doesn't know you, we just pray that you convict their heart. Help them to know that they're a sinner. You are all sinners, your Father. Repenting judgment, do. That was going to be our end. Because of your saving grace, your Father, you rescued us, not only just from hell, but you've also planted us, your Father, in the reality that we're now your sons and daughters. What a blessing that is. And that that will never end. And I pray, your Father, that even today, if there's one here that doesn't know you, that you forget their heart. I pray for your children, that you would just do work in each one of our hearts. Help us to realize that the chief end of man is not to make a name for ourselves, not to accumulate everything that we can while we're here, but it's to glorify you. Help us, your Father, to love you with a pure heart. Help us to serve you, your Father, not begrudgingly, not for notoriety, but because you've given us a heart to do so. And I pray, your Father, that even during this invitation, you would just help us time to be a time for us to spend in prayer, maybe even in praise, just realizing who you are and the glory that's truly due to your name. I pray that during this invitation you speak to hearts as only you can. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Well, if you would please stand in presentation number 31.
going to be short, I promise. The business meeting, um, and if, uh, if you'd like to, well, we've got quite a few people, but you can stay on both sides today. Normally, if you go over to one side, there's not. Um, but anyway, we'll have a five minute break, and then we'll reconvene here uh, for the meeting. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much just for speaking to our hearts and making us honor. Thank you so much just for even the Sunday school hour, Brother Al, us in here, and this hour. Pray your Father, you'd help us not to be forgetful of what we've learned even here today. Help us to apply it to our hearts. Also, we submit not sin against you, but also we might be.